So do you believe in a historical person like some leader, Moses? Yes, it could be. Yes, okay. uh, I would not turn it down. Another question. Does the most Egyptologists believe in uh, some form of uh, historical access like you? I think so. Yes, of course. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome to NT Podcast. My name is Nemanja Jurišić and today we are very honored to have Professor Dr. Manfred Bitak. Dr. Bitak, how are you? Thank you, thank you. Bye. Professor Bitak uh, championed the study of Egyptian archaeology and Egypt. He is Professor Emeritus of Egyptology at the University of Vienna. Uh, he is best known as the director of Austrian excavation at two sites in the Nile Delta, Tel Al Daba, which was identified as the location of Avaris, the capital of Hyksos period, and P. Ramses, which was the capital of the 19th dynasty of Egypt. Dr. Bitak is the founder of, and the director of the Austrian Archaeological Institute in Cairo, 1973 to 2009. He was chairman of Institute of Egyptology, 1984 to 2009, and of the Vienna Institute of Archaeological Science from 2004 to 2011. At the University of Vienna and chairman of the Commission for Ed Egypt and uh, the Levant at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Additionally, he has supervised and reviewed at least 40 PhD dissertations and at least 18 uh, master's theses. He also published more than 20 self-authored uh, or edited monographs and close to 200 articles. Am I correct? Yeah, nearly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. Uh, today we are going to uh, hear something about the Exodus. Uh, I believe in Exodus and Bible, so I want to hear uh, what a real archaeologist said about that. So uh, thank you, Vita, for that, and you can start. Yeah, hello, uh, dear colleagues uh, in Serbia. Yeah. Well, I uh, would like to introduce you uh, to the uh, research in uh, trying to find uh, uh, a historical scenario for the Exodus uh, and also the a geographical scenario of, of the Exodus. Uh, I dealt with it from time to time. I wrote my Habil uh, dissertation on the geography of the Eastern Delta and used this knowledge to uh, dig into the into the uh, story of the Exodus, which, as you know, there are people who were scholars who refute that there was a historical Exodus. And, uh, of course, uh, there are other people, I mean, other scholars who believe in the historicity of the Exodus. Now, here, please, what I have to contribute to that, I uh, would like to add that I'm not a, uh, a scholar of ancient testament. I'm an Egyptologist and Near Eastern archaeologist. And uh, I dealt with the historical geography. And it is from that angle that I try to introduce you to this subject. Well, let us first go to Upper Egypt, uh, to Luxor, to Thebes, Western Thebes. Uh, um, you, everybody perhaps knows Medinet Habu, the enormous temple of Ramses III, which was uh, constructed just as, uh, just south of uh, the temple of Aya and Horemheb. And it is within the temple of Aya and Horemheb uh, that uh, the University of Chicago, between the two wars, uh, found a very interesting building without knowing what they have found. Uh, anyway, it is uh, at the northern edge of this precinct of the Temple of Aya and Horemheb, they found a so-called four-room house, uh, dating uh, probably to the time of Ramses IV, uh, which is uh, early in the 13th, uh, early in the 12th century BCE. 
uh, what is the Forum House? The Forum House is considered by Israeli archaeologists as a prototypical house of uh, the Israelites. It is the typical house from uh, the beginning of the Iron Age one until uh, the end uh, of uh, of the uh, of the divided kingdom at the beginning of the of the exile period. Uh, uh, I myself wonder if uh, this house is really was on, really constructed and was developed only by the proto-Israelites, probably also by tribes which were related to them. But uh, at that time, in the time of Ramses IV, I think the ethnogenesis of the Israelites has not yet been terminated, and uh, they were still. Uh, a series of, of tribes uh, roaming around and uh, uh, from which pool later the Israelites uh, originated. Well, the uh, earliest forum houses appeared at uh, Tel Batash in Israel, uh, which is also called Timna, known as Timna, next, a site excavated by Ami Hanazar from the Hebrew University. But then also it's from the transition of the uh, late uh, Bronze Age to the early Iron Age one. Uh, from the same time, it's, uh, uh, a, a forum house was founded in uh, Jordan, just south of Amman, Tel El Umeiri, and also in Wadi El Lahun. Uh, also everything very early in the in the time of uh, or the beginning of the Iron Age. Uh, well, to cut it short, I personally think the exodus and uh, the emergence of the proto-Israelites cannot be dated before uh, the very late uh, uh, late Bronze Age, uh, let us say late in the uh, late in the 13th century and at the beginning of the Iron Age. Uh, around 1200 BC, not before. And you may know there are many theories about Exodus in the time of Ramses II, or even much before in the time of Ahmose, or even in the Middle Kingdom. All this is nonsense and is uh, not possible to, uh, to uh, uh, I mean, to argue because any archaeological remains which can be tied to the emergence of the proto-Israelites only date from the beginning of the late uh, of, of the late of the end of the late Bronze Age at, at the beginning of the Iron Age. Well, this is uh, from Timna. You see, by Forum House, you have a tree aisled uh, main part of a building and a kind of broad room at one end. Uh, there are some variations, of course. Here you have also um, the entrance is, is uh, protected with a kind of, of L-shaped wall. Uh, this is a reconstruction of, uh, um, of this house. Uh, it is considered that uh, the middle part was an open courtyard. Typically are also the columns. And as you will see later, columns only on one side. Well, this is Tel El Umayri in the Madaba plain, just south of Amman. You see the same kind of plan. You have a broad room at the end and the tree aisled uh, part of the main uh, building. And also here a protection of the entrance uh, by an L-shaped uh, wall. Well, this is... Uh, uh, another one from El Lahun with a reconstruction. This is a prototypical uh, four-room house, also here in Tel Mazos in, uh, in the Negev, excavated by uh, late Aharon Kempinski. You see different uh, um, variations of this, especially here, the variation with only one aisle with uh, columns or with pillars. Uh, the other one firmly uh, walled. Uh, this is uh, Iron Age one. Uh, it is a real prototypical uh, type of house, 
And now, uh, how did this type of house come to the Western Thebes? We have to try to find an, an explanation for it. And the explanation is that Ramses III, he is his statue found at Beit Shan, uh, in the in the Jordan Valley, Ramses III made a raid to the desert of Zayil, and uh, he captured numerous Shosu Bedouins. The Shosu uh, can be considered as a a group of tribes which uh, were a constant annoyance of the Egyptians from the time of the 18th dynasty onwards. I mean, Hotep II, so the silent follower of Tutmosis III, uh, captured numerous, with raids, numerous of the Shosu Bedouins. And uh, our theory is that uh, among the Shosu Bedouins was also a tribe which uh, constituted uh, the core of the later proto Israelites. Anyway, he made a raid uh, to the desert of Zaire which is uh, practically identical with uh, the mountains of Edom. Edom means red, the mountains are red. And he captured, he took many, many Shosu back to Egypt. And I think the builders of this uh, uh, forum house in the precinct of uh, Aya and Horemheb were captured Shosu Bedouins, which uh, were distributed among the temples all over Egypt. And uh, their task was to pull down the temple of Aya and Horemheb and to build a new temple of Ramses IV. So the date is early in the 12th century, first part of the 12th century BC, of this forum house found by the University of Chicago without identifying it, uh, but uh, explaining it correctly as a shelter for workmen who had to pull down the temple of Aya and Horeme and to rebuild to build a new temple for Ramses IV. Anyway, uh, now let us go to the northern part of Egypt. Uh, uh, we know that uh, the children of Israel, according to the Bible, had to do forced labor in the towns of uh, Ramses and Pitom, or Pitom and Ramses, it's mentioned in this uh, way. Uh, today, for a long time, we couldn't identify it, and until recently, Pitom was uh, thought to be Tel uh, Maschuta at the eastern edge of the Wadi Tumilat, which con connects the Nile Delta with the northern Sinai, or with the more central Sinai, uh, and uh, also the town of Ramses. There was a big debate, where is Ramses? Gardiner thought it is at Pelusium, or uh, Piemonte thought it is in Tanis, because in Tanis, as you will see, uh, there are many monuments uh, originating from uh, the Ramses town, which were shipped there much later, and I will explain you why. Anyway, these two towns can be, in our days, identified beyond any doubt. And we have now already two biblical toponyms, firm biblical toponyms, which help us to reconstruct uh, the whole story of the uh, Exodus. Uh, well, this is the Wadi Tumilat. You see today it is uh, uh, enclosed by attempts of the Egyptian government to increase uh, agricultural land. But uh, uh, and in the French, in the time of uh, Napoleon's expedition to Egypt, 1799 to 1802, uh, the French engineers uh, uh, surveyed uh, very accurately the Wadi Tumilat, and they also found vestiges of uh, the ancient um, Canal, the linking the delta system with the Gulf of Suez, the so-called uh, Canal of uh, Necho and Darius, and later the canal was always uh, sanded up, and so then it was bailed out, dredged out again in the Roman time, in the Ptolemaic times, in the Roman times, and also in medieval times, it was uh, 
uh, known as the Khalid al uh, Amir al Mu'minin, the the canal of the of the uh, ruler of the uh, fidels, and uh, this who was of course uh, the Khalifa in uh, in Baghdad. Uh, anyway, this is uh, the most important place. And in my uh, geographical studies, I was able to reconstruct uh, the historical model of this place. Uh, the eastern, the western part was covered by an enormous lake, uh, 18 kilometers long, 1.8 kilometers wide. Uh, and uh, yes, Tel which uh, was uh, an enormous fortress of re in the Renaissance times. There may be smaller fortresses also uh, further in the in the east, but they have not been found. But this was a major fortress of the Ramesides, and uh, in the time also when uh, of the of the uh, sojourn to Egypt um, by the proto-Israelites, most probably. We will immediately talk more about it. But uh, this uh, enormous lake was. Uh, fed by uh, Nile branches uh, from time to time. Uh, and uh, so it was an overflow lake. Well, this Wadi Tumilat is a very interesting place because uh, it, uh, uh, there are toponyms, uh, Semitic toponyms in the Wadi Tumilat even used by the Egyptians, uh, by the Egyptian scribes. And such toponyms develop only if there is a Semitic-speaking population. And these toponyms we know only from the Ramesside period. Uh, and uh, this is most interesting. Among the toponyms, besides Cheku, Cheku could be an older toponym, perhaps originating already in the Hyksos period, but it means it was identified with uh, Sukkot, which are temporary shelters uh, used by semi-nomades, even until our days at the eastern edge of Egypt. Then we have uh, Brechot, which means the lake or the lakes, not the ponds, as uh, translated uh, by Egyptologists in Arabic, uh, Birkat is a more uh, appropriate uh, uh, meaning than Seger. Seger is, uh, means uh, the enceinte, the uh, enclosure, wall, mainly of fortresses. Then Gezem, uh, which uh, Sarah Israelit Groll from the Hebrew University identified with Goshen, with the biblical end of Goshen, and this is very likely the right uh, explanation. And uh, this is uh, uh, is mentioned, is tied in the, in the text, together with a lake where storms uh, developed enormous waves. This can only be a very big lake, and we have this lake. Besides that, there are other Semitic uh, toponyms in the, in the northern Sinai, like uh, uh, Migdol or the Meket there, uh, which is a uh, tower, means tower. Jaro is uh, the French fortress, Jaro is uh, not uh, uh, safely identified as a Semitic toponym, but the others are, they are all Semitic toponyms. Anyway, this is a kind of uh, Sukkot, a temporary shelter which uh, nomades still use in the northern Sinai. This photograph is from my uh, colleague uh, Hofmeyer, who worked in this region. But very important for us is uh, the Papyrus Anastasis VI, which uh, uh, dates to the time of uh, Seti II, uh, so late, very late in the 13th century BC. Uh, and uh, it mentions uh, that uh, a troop of Shosu um, Bedouins from Edom asked the Egyptian authorities to move in, and the Egyptian authorities allowed them to move into the Wadi Tumilat, and they were allowed to move until the, the lakes of Pitom, which can only be here near the fortress of uh, 
Telerretaba, which can be identified with Pitom, as you will see immediately. And uh, it was called, uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the Birkabot, I mean, the, the, the lakes of Pitom. Uh, and where you have Semitic toponyms, they only develop if Semitic speaking people live there and, uh, uh, in the Ramesside period. And this is very exciting. And also exciting is the date. Until now, it was uh, considered only a text which gives an illustration how the Proto-Israelites may have moved to Egypt. But now, as we date this Isodos and Exodos much later into the 20th dynasty, uh, this is a very hot uh, region, as, especially as they came from Edom, as you will see. Anyway, the, here is a fortress of Tel Aritaba, a Remesite fortress with a temple of uh, Atum, therefore the house of Atum, Kitom, uh, has to be identified with this place, and there is no. And here you on the pylon of this temple, uh, which was found by Flinders Petrie, you see the pharaoh Ramses II smiting a Shoso Bedouin, and uh, the god Atum, who is the primeval god of Heliopolis, the sun god, he hands him the scimitar to kill uh, the. Uh, the show so, uh, and uh, this also shows that this was a major uh, route of incoming show so Bedouins. This is a photograph of uh, Petrie's uh, uh, excavation from Tel Eretabe. And now, uh, this um, Apios Anastasi mentions as the origin of these uh, Bedouins coming in to keep them alive. I mean, the Egyptians were generous at the time, from time to time, to keep them and their flocks alive. There was, uh, in, at the end of the uh, 13th century BC, a beginning uh, uh, penury, I mean, a beginning uh, dryness in the climate. So uh, the first who, who, who uh, sense these are the Bedouins and to keep them alive and their uh, Flocks, they have to move, and they move to Egypt, which offers perennial water. And they came from Edom. Edom is a very interesting place. Uh, they are the, it's a mountainous country, a very bizarre mountainous country. Edom means red. The mountains are red sandstone. And from here, they came from. Uh, it is interesting that uh, uh, several texts, text pl places in the Bible mention that uh, the Lord came forth from Edom. And uh, it means that obviously in the memory, in the tradition of the Bible, this is the place where the cult of Yahweh came from. And uh, we have uh, some more evidence of it. In the Remicide, and also already before, in the time of uh, Amenhotep III, uh, they are mentioning uh, former, I mean, foreign toponyms. Among the toponyms mentioned connection with Zeir, the desert of Zeir, is uh, Tashasu uh, Ichwa, uh, which is identified by Raphael Givion and uh, uh, Manfred Görg and many others with uh, the tetragram with Yahweh. So Yahweh was originally probably a toponym and it should be found in this place, maybe in Edom in the desert of Seir. And uh, when now we have this troop of Shoso Bedouins entering Wadi Tumilat in the, at the end of the of the uh, 13th century, in the time of uh, Seti II, it is most important uh, to have in the back of our mind that this is a place, it's a hot spot from where they came from. And we are not sure they may be proto-Israelites or not, but at least they were, we, we can say they were 
relatives, at least. It must be a tribe which was closely related to the Proto-Israelites. Now we shall examine another uh, stela or another um, evidence. Uh, it's a stela, the so-called Israel stela, because for the first time in the reign of uh, of Meriem Ptah, the lived in the second part towards the end of the of the 13th century BC was the success of Ramses II. After the very long reign of Ramses II, uh, Meriem Ptah uh, set up a stela, a victory stela, because he had troubles, uh, mainly with the Libyans. The Libyans tried in several raids to enter the Nile Delta and even they were able to to uh, cover most of the Nile Delta, even the Eastern Nile Delta, uh, what we know from the victory inscription of uh, of Merentach. Anyway, but it's called Israel Stela because uh, it's the first time uh, uh, that uh, the name of Israel is mentioned on a historical uh, source. And uh, it mentions several toponyms. It seems that uh, in the southern part of the Levant, which was governed by Egypt at the time, the, in the Egyptian province of Canaan, the wars of Merimptach against uh, the Libyans on the opposite side of, uh, of uh, Egypt uh, uh, instigated uh, the towns to rebel against the Egyptian supervision and uh, administration in Canaan. So Merimptach he was engaged in the fifth year against uh, the Libyans, but he was also engaged in a campaign in Canaan. And uh, on the stela, he mentions first uh, Gaza, I mean Canaan, which has to be identified with uh, Tel Gaza, Ashkelon, Gezer, Yenoam, uh, south of, uh, southeast of the Tiberias Lake. And afterwards is mentioned Israel. Israel, whereas the other places where toponyms, Israel is not a toponym. It has as a classifier the people. Uh, the people. You see a man and a woman and the plural uh, classifier of the plurality. So this means they were not sedentary yet. And probably Israel, the core group, was beyond the the uh, Tiberias Lake at that time in the in the in the in France Jordan. Uh, this is very interesting and important. Now we come to the to other toponyms. I mean, we said we talked about the Ramses and the Piton, uh, the two places where the children of Israel, according to the Bible, had to do enforced labor. It's interesting. Uh, uh, I don't think that one can put aside this tradition because uh, normally in the history of people, uh, it is uh, victories and, and uh, important deeds that are remembered and mentioned, uh, bragging even. Uh, and here it is a story of slavery and forced labor, which is not... Uh, not so famous for for people to uh, to be proud of, and therefore I believe this is uh, a tradition which has a historical core, and we have to believe it. Uh, and uh, also, the history of uh, Ramses and Pitom in the Eastern Delta and near the Eastern Delta, uh, also the geography is important. Uh, uh, an important part. Anyway, this is uh, a map of a reconstruction of Piramesse, the Ramses town, which is uh, mainly on top of an island uh, uh, of the Nile, of the easternmost Nile branch, uh, excavated in the last 30 years by the Pelletius Museum Hildesheim, but uh, also in the northern part uh, of Avaris, excavated by us. Uh, so Ramses Town covered about six hundred, uh, uh, I mean uh, six hundred 
per hectares, which is six square kilometers. And not for at that time, one of the biggest towns in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, Piramese was started to be built up by Hornhep, who constructed an enormous fortress and he reconstructed the Temple of Seth. Before that, between Awaris and Piramese, this was the major Egyptian military harbor uh, known as Peru Nefa, you know, a happy sortie, it means. Uh, and uh, we know that in our uh, that uh, Canaanite cults continued in Peru Nefa. We know that there was a temple of Baal and the temple of Astarte and, and uh, the, of uh, Kuchu. And anyway, uh, and also in Piramese, these cults continued. Uh, so there was a kind of continuum after the Hyksos were uh, defeated and were probably distributed all over the country. But this is a very important uh, uh, asset of us. This is a wall of Horemheb, Horemheb's fortress cutting into a big, big palace of uh, Tutmosis III and uh, Amenhotep II. Here we have tiles of Horemheb and also Horemheb revived in his uh, scarab uh, uh, patterns, uh, uh, motifs from the Hyksos period. But uh, this is uh, are the remains of the temple of uh, Seth, the weather god, the Egyptian storm god, uh, in Awaris, but originating from a temple of the storm god of the Hyksos. We found this lintel of a, a sanctuary of uh, Seth, Sotech uh, Pechti. Uh, with the uh, cartouches of Horemheb, and within this temple we found uh, remains of uh, of a vineyard. You see, it's a pergola system. Uh, we also found uh, uh, in this pergola system. What is it? Uh, we found within this pergola system. A, a wine press. Screen sharing, what is it? Yeah. This is a famous dealer of 400 years uh, where Ramses II uh, uh, gives an offering to God said, but it is not the Egyptian God said, as you can see, it's the Syrian storm God. Baal Tsephon, with uh, the Syrian kilt, with tassels, with the high crown of Syrian kings and gods, with a long pommel, with a crossed, uh, 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 crossed bands over his chest. This is Baal Tsephon, originating uh, from the Hyksos, not from the Hyksos period, from before the Hyksos period, from the time of the 14th dynasty. King Nehesi introduced or built a temple for a king, for the god Balsiphon uh, uh, in Avaris. And this still is a memory of the 400 years since the foundation of this temple until the Ramesside period. Uh, and at the same time, uh, this god is mentioned or is uh, not only mentioned, he is considered as the ancestor god of this dynasty to, uh, um, to argue the divine origin of this dynasty, which was not of a royal origin. Uh, they claim that they originate from the god Sutech, but in reality from the Syrian storm god. And this storm god had a very long temple history at, at the site of Avaris. Although the stela was found at uh, Tanis, but it was uh, dislocated in the, the 21st, 22nd dynasty. And so uh, originally it was set up at the pylon of the temple of Sutech, which was south of Piramese. And this is a 
from the King Nehesi of the 14th dynasty, uh, which dates around 1700 BC, uh, showing Nehesi he was beloved of Seed, who was this is the interpretatio Egyptiaca of uh, of the Syrian storm god, and he is shown here as a Levantine king with a Levantine crown, but and but uh, he was uh, I mean his image on this uh, obelisk was uh, damaged uh, probably at uh, at the end of the 14th dynasty, which. Uh, was taken by over by the Hyksos. Uh, it's another story. Anyway, we have evidence that uh, the Syrian storm god had a cult in, in Avaris already in the time of the 14th dynasty, probably even before. This is a sealed cylinder of hematite showing the Syrian storm god stepping from the mountain of Khazi to the mountain of Nani. The Khazi is a uh, Northern mountain, Jebel Akra in Syria, and Nani is the Amanus mountain. He is the storm god of Syria. He is the overlord of the sea, uh, the vindicator of the sea. He had subdued the sea, which is represented here as a snake. The snake Yam is also a god on the podest, but at the same time, he's the patron of the sailors. Behind him is the weather bull, uh, and uh, but uh, the cryptic style uh, is influenced by Egyptian uh, art, according to Edith Porada, who was perhaps the best expert in Syrian cryptic art, uh, late Edith Porada. Anyway, we found a temple from the 14th dynasty, a broad room temple, one of the biggest in the Levant. Here is an altar. Here's another temple, a bent axis temple. And so uh, while uh, road room temples are temples considered uh, for male gods in the Levant, bent axis temples are considered for female gods, for goddesses. So we have here a divine couple, but uh, beside here is another temple, an Egyptian type of temple. So he, but uh, this, we have uh, reason enough to think that this was a temple of Set, of, or the better to say, of the Syrian storm god. Uh, and uh, which fits very well to a harbor town, because Avaris was a harbor town from its very beginning, from the 12th dynasty onwards, it was a harbor town. And uh, to build a temple for the patron of the sailors, and the overlord of the sea is only uh, very uh, logic. Uh, besides, his consort may have been, in this case, Asherah. Asherah had also the title Mistress of the Sea, or the Asherah who walks on the sea. A very meaningful uh, divinities for a harbor town. Anyway. This is a map of Piramesse of Gantir, uh, excavated, as I said, by uh, the Pelizios Museum Hildesheim in 30 years, but the excavation are now continued again by the same institution. And it uh, was an enormous town. And uh, of course, they need soldiers, they needed workmen. If you look at the building activity, 600 hectares were constructed in a short time with palaces, with living quarters, uh, with official kiosks of receiving uh, other people, with temples from where to take the workmen. <clears throat> and Ramses, the Ramses town was already started by Horem and later by Seti the first, the father of Ramses the second, as we can see from the tiles, faience tiles, which once uh, embellished uh, the walls of uh, the palace of uh, Piramese, found by the Egyptian Antiquities Service uh, uh, at Gantir in the 20s, in the late 20s. Anyway, 
uh, itself. Enormous sites with, uh, for instance, uh, a stable for horses, for 500 horses from the time of the 20th dynasty, but truly it has a predecessor, an older predecessor from the time of the 19th dynasty. Here you see how the horses were fettered on these stones and they had even uh, uh, they had even toilets, the horses, you know, so that uh, they kept uh, healthy in their hoofs because if they stand in their urine, it is a danger that they would get uh, diseases uh, in their hoofs. Uh, also, they excavated uh, a workshop uh, for a military workshop where they found fittings for chariots of alabaster, of metal. Uh, swords, sophisticated <coughs> arrowheads. All this, this was found south of the palace. Uh, the horse stables are here. And there were also, we, our, our team, made a survey of Gantier uh, with uh, probing with uh, uh, my colleague Josef Dorner found several Canals, so you have to imagine a kind of a town which was uh, which had uh, canals where um, the main traffic uh, was diverted. Also, here an artificial lake in front of the temple of Amun Re Harach the Athon. Well, the site was uh, situated here, and uh, if you think of an Exodus from here, people could only walk northwards to the Sinai, and if they wanted to avoid the frontier fortresses, they had to walk wade through the Balach lakes, which were much bigger at that time because they were fed by the easternmost Nile branch. But what I wanted to say is that at the end of the 20th dynasty, the easternmost Nile branch, which uh, issued here in the Mediterranean uh, was blocked by sediments. Uh, in the 20th dynasty, the annual dredging of the Nile branches didn't function anymore. There was no authority. So the, the Nile branches were blocked. The waters were diverted to the next Nile branch, the Tanitic Nile branch via this canal. But uh, Piramesse couldn't be anymore a harbor. It was too far away from the sea. Uh, so therefore, they, uh, they moved the capital to Tharis, the 21st and 22nd dynasty in the 12th, in the 11th century BC. They moved to Tharis and also to Bubastis. And in order to build the new residences, they took all the stone monuments from Piramesse to Tanis to build the new temples and uh, uh, and to Bubastis. So these were the two capitals of, of the Libyan dynasties. So therefore, you find today in Tanis and in Bubastis um, stone monuments of the 19th dynasty, but also older stone, stone monuments uh, which were originally in Avaris. <clears throat> this famous Rixos Sphinxes, which dates, however, to the 12th dynasty, for example. And what remained behind, in some cases, were feet and pedestals of colossal statues, which were broken off during the transportation and taking off the statues in Tutanis. Anyway, in the 21st, 22nd dynasties, in the 11th and 10th century BCE, the stones were transported to Tanis and to Bubastis. And this caused, much later, in the 4th and 3rd century BC, that uh, in Tanis they believed, because there uh, were statues of priests, of, of uh, the gods of uh, Ramses of Piranesse, uh, because they found these titles in much older statuary. So cults were established independently in Tanis for the gods of Piramesse and in Bubastis also there were established uh, uh, priests 
and uh, cults for the gods of Piramesse and of for Ramses II as well. And this is the reason why uh, in the exilic period, uh, Jewish exiles trying to find the vestiges of their ancestors in Egypt believed, I mean, they had to follow what the Egyptians believed at the time. Piramese was at that time already 700 years uh, abandoned and therefore uh, it was forgotten where it was. In Tanis, they believed here was Piramese. In Bubastis, they believed nearby, maybe uh, Tel El Kibir or, uh, or maybe at Piton was Piramese. Anyway, uh, cults, secondary cults on the gods of Ramses and uh, of, of, of the gods of Ramses of Piramese developed independently in Tanis and in Bubastis in the fourth and the third millennium BC, uh, century BC, uh, in the time of the 30th and the uh, uh, 30th dynasty when Egypt uh, started to become very uh, self conscious and again in the Ptolemaic uh, the period in the third century BC. Now we will deal with the question, when could have happened the Exodus? Well, today we don't believe in one Exodus. We think there were several Exoduses, at least two. One option is in the time, I mean, you, you have to imagine that a larger group of people, let us say several hundred people, could leave Egypt only in times when the border was not strictly supervised. Otherwise, they would have been stopped. This, the first opportunity appeared in the transition period of the 19th to the 20th dynasty. There were at least four or five years where Egypt, uh, in Egypt there was turmoil. There were parties who fought each other. One of the main contenders for the Kingship was uh, the general Seth Nachte. In his stela in Elephantine, he mentions that he uh, was able to, to uh, overcome his uh, adversaries, among them a Syrian with the name Irsu, who may have been a model for Joseph, for the Joseph story. Anyway, Seth Nacht was able to expel them, uh, the foreigners fled, but uh, he mentions that they were bribed by the Egyptians, his opponents, uh, with silver and gold. Now it's interesting in the there are, uh, at least one, one, if not two, uh, parts in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, where it is mentioned that the Israelites took silver and gold from the Egyptians when they left. Uh, it was always thought this, uh, the Egyptians were glad that they left and, and, and paid them to, to leave. But the, this is illogical because uh, why should they afterwards uh, try to stop them of leaving? Anyway, I think this could be an option, a period of leaving. For instance, Pyramese. But uh, till now, the, the, the text of the Exodus combines the Exodus mentioning Ramses and Piton. But uh, the two are apart and separated uh, not only by the Nile, but they are also separated by the Bahrel Baga drainage system. It was an enormous overflow lake, natural overflow lake which uh, protected Egypt from the east. So in order to go from Pyramese to Piton, they would have to go first south and then eastwards. Very unlikely. I think uh, we can claim there was a second exodus uh, from Piton. I think the text also starts the exodus from Piton, another text message started from Piton. When could this have happened? Well, in the time of Ramses III, so relatively early in the 12th century BC, uh, 
uh, sea people conquered parts of the Egyptian province of Canaan. Probably in the fifth year of Ramses III, they entered Canaan, the coastal Canaan, and established bridgeheads in what later became Philistia, the Pentapolis or Philistia, but other sea people, the Chekhov in Dor, the Sheridan in, in the Gulf of uh, Akho. So bridgeheads were established and uh, uh, they were lost for Egypt. Egypt was only able to keep up its province in the Jordan Valley and in the southern part of Canaan. But th these bridgeheads were lost forever. And from these bridgeheads, the Philistines and other sea people tried to assault Egypt by land and by sea. They must have stayed already for some time in this land because they came with wagons and, or by land. From where do see people have wagons? They produced them here. So they entered Egypt by land, but also by sea, by two-pronged approach. By sea, they entered along the Pelusiac branch of the Nile, but they stopped here. They were stopped here uh, at the mouth of the Nile, but they were able to destroy frontier fortresses already, as uh, Jim Hofmeyer was able to prove. But they also entered by land, but uh, the land and sea battle, which is uh, illustrated at the northern wall of Medinet Habu, happened nearly at the same place. Well, Ramses III was victorious, but uh, I don't know when, but either before uh, the approach of the sea paper or afterwards, he fortified the frontier fortresses. He fortified one of the biggest frontier fortresses, which was Telerotabe in the Wadi Tumilat. The walls were doubled. Uh, this site is excavated now. I mean, it was found by Petrie. Originally, it was excavated now, or is excavated now by a Polish uh, Slovak expedition, uh, and uh, they found uh, and could date also the temple and uh, and the uh, enclosure walls, and uh, they were able to identify the enlargement of the enclosure wall to twenty meters diameter. You have to imagine it's an enormous enclosure wall, uh, and so. Uh, this means that Ramses II, the third, was, if here you see the enclosure wall, the enormous size of the enclosure wall of Ramses III. Uh, this happened uh, probably before or after the sea people invasion, because maybe he was afraid of a second attempt. This uh, is an aerial photograph of the, en of the entrance of the fortress, the western entrance of the fortress. You can see how enormous these towers are. So they beat an enormous fortress. But there were other fortresses. Another one was found by Shafiq Farid uh, in the, uh, I think it was in the 50s at Kolzum, uh, which is a site uh, just north of, a little bit north of, uh, Suez, and they had approached to the Red Sea from there. It's an enormous fortress also. It's uh, smaller than Wadi Tumilat, but it's more than 100 meters, 200 cubits by 200 cubits, an enormous fortress. And I think there were more fortresses like that, uh, which were, however, destroyed during uh, the activity of building the Suez Canal in the 19th century. Anyway, uh, if you try, from where did he have the workmen to, to build such enormous fortresses? I mean, especially the one in the Wadi Tumilat. And we learned that in the Wadi Tumilat lived sedentary nomads. Well, try today to force nomads to build 
such enormous fortresses. I think they would say Mas- Masalama and would uh, disappear overnight. And this could only happen in the turmoil years when the sea people invaded Egypt. Uh, and this is a second option when the exodus could have happened. Well, with this, I, I finish my account again. The North and South theory of the Exodus were produced by the uh, using Pyramesse as a quarry in the 21st, 22nd dynasties. Therefore, you have in the late period uh, Tanis and Bubastis uh, secondary cults of the gods of Pyramesse. And following these secondary cults, the theories of the northern and the southern exodus, but in reality, the southern exodus may have happened as a separate exodus, but surely an exodus has happened from Pyramesse. And if you, if you move from Pyramesse northwards between, you have, you are obliged to move between the Pelusiac branch and the Bachrel Baga drainage system until you have to leave the track, the Horus Road, uh, and pass the many frontier fortresses. And if you want to avoid this, you have to wade through the Balach Lakes. And I think the Balach Lake is the Yamsuf, the Sea of Reeds, Pa uh, Chufi in ancient Egyptian. It's an Egyptian name which was taken over by the early Israelites. And uh, it's another proof that they had a good idea about the geography or memory. The memory uh, was kept alive uh, in the, uh, in the uh, verbal transmission. The Pa Chufi is also mentioned uh, in the uh, Onomasticon Amenope, between Tanis and uh, Ramses. Uh, and it is exactly between Tanis and, or near Tanis and Ramses. So Pachufi is another biblical toponym. Besides the Horus Road, or the, the way of the Philistines, uh, it leads to the Philistia. And this is also the road where the Philistines came on the land route. All this shows that uh, the biblical tradition has kept a quite a good memory of the geographical situation of the eastern border of Egypt. Uh, and it cannot be uh, argued that uh, uh, this is an invention of the, from the Persian period or before, slightly before the Persian period as many of our colleagues now think. Because Pyramesse is not mentioned in any, in any uh, document between the 20th dynasty and the third millennium, a third, uh, uh, the third, I mean, the fourth and the third century BC uh, with the secondary cults of Pyramesse. Nothing in between. So therefore, uh, to mention the town of Ramses in the time of the Persian period or the exilic period is very unlikely. Uh, they have kept a relatively good memory on the eastern border of Egypt. Uh, and therefore, I think that uh, a core of the Exodus is correct. It wasn't you know, thousands of people, it were perhaps some some hundreds of people maximum. And uh, these some hundred people were able to bring with them the story of the Exodus. And because of their political importance in the future of the ethnogenesis of Israel, uh, became suddenly a saga uh, of uh, importance for the history of uh, ancient Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bittak. I really enjoyed in your lectures. So it was really 
Interesting. So uh, thank you. Uh, do you have a few minutes uh, for questions, maybe? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, would you uh, identify Mount Sinai as a traditional site? Well, there are several sites, you know, you have the mentioning of the Mount Sinai, you have the mentioning of the uh, mountain of Horeb. There are two mountains and later merge other mountains also in this in the story. Uh, we don't know really where the mountain of, I mean, I don't think that the mountain of Sinai uh, will be, I mean, by the transition localizes it was the real mountain of Sinai. However, it may have been one of the many mountains where uh, the proto-Israelites believed God uh, re resides. It is a, f a kind of, of uh, fiction of the, the, the uh, storm god who lives on the mountain, on several mountains, which was transferred uh, to uh, the god of the Israelites. And you have, uh, besides, I mean, if you look at the itinerary, uh, it's it's far too long till they arrived. It's month is still they arrived at the foot of the mountain of Sinai. So this must be just uh, quite uh, a distance away. But uh, to say something about uh, what uh, is believed today I mean, by the uh, general public to be the mountain of Sinai, there could have been also a sanctuary of nomads, which was kept up uh, much later by uh, proto-Arabic -Ar uh, nomads, because there is a there is a passage in the in the book of uh, Exodus where uh, they ask the pharaoh to allow them to go three days to a sanctuary to, to honor uh, Yahweh or the God, the Lord. And uh, I mean, three days is also a little bit uh, fast, but it is, you can reach in some days the, the mountain of what is today, the Sinai. And I think uh, this is one tradition, but uh, mm -hmm. surely there were several mountains of, of uh, Sinai. Uh, therefore, you have the main names okay that's reasonable thank you another question does at the most egyptologists believe in uh, some form of uh, historical exodus like you i think so yes of course uh, kenneth kitchen mm -hmm. was considered as a fundamentalist <laughs> uh, but uh, kenneth kitchen was an excellent scholar and uh, uh, i wouldn't uh, uh, believe in everything what he wrote but uh, Kenneth Kitchen was a very keen scholar or is a very keen still alive uh, and uh, he wrote a book on the Old Testament and there were other uh, e uh, Egyptologists who wrote uh, about the Exodus and about uh, Moses I mean among them Jan Asman uh, so uh, there is there are Egyptologists who believe in the historicity of the Exodus and the historicity, perhaps, of Moses, uh, because also the name of Moses is interesting. It means it's a short form of a theophoric name. Uh, as you know, theophoric names were very common in ancient Egypt, like uh, uh, Tutmose, which means uh, the god Tot is born, or Ra Mose, the god Re is born, or I mean, the uh, Set Moses, Set is born. And mm -hmm. if you shorten this, you also call, you only call him Moses. Like in Arabic, you call uh, many Abdu, it's despite they have a much, I mean, the name is uh, the slave of, uh, I mean, uh, Abdel Hakim, Abdel Karim, Abdel Nebi, and so on and so on. They are just shortened, called Abdu. And so the name Moses. Uh, is an Egyptian name, a shortened theophoric name. The shortened theophoric name is even uh, 
mentioned on the stela. We have a stela, the so-called. Uh, I mean, a stela which originates surely from 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 Piramesse, uh, and uh, on this stela, a soldier has the name Meso. It's the same name like Moses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, do you believe in a historical uh, person like uh, some leader, Moses? It is. Yes, it could be. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I would uh, not. I, I would not. Uh, I, uh, I would not turn it down. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you comment uh, on uh, Berlin's uh, pedestal? Does that mention uh, Israel name or not? You mean the pedestal in the Museum of Berlin? Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, it is a reconstruction uh, by um, Manfred Görg and also by my colleague, whom I highly, I mean, admire, is Wolfgang Zwickel. But I think uh, this is not a proof. The stella is from, I mean, the pedestal is from the Ramesside period, if I remember correctly. But it is not a proof of, uh, of Israel. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you see any uh, thematical parallels between Ipur papyrus uh, and uh, Exodus story? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> the Isodos, the sojourn to Egypt, I mean, is at least well illustrated in the Papyrus Anastasi 6. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, next, uh, about Shasso Piaku, uh, is it a shortcut of capital city or uh, more likely shortcut of a uh, deity like Yahweh? What do you think? Not of a city, of a toponym. A toponym must not be a city. It could be a, a mountain. It could be a, a region. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, perhaps originally it was a it was a a place name. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't. I mean, it could, could be that the place name has something to do with uh, with, a, with a specific god. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's very yeah. difficult to answer. Anyway, it is uh, known as a place name. And it is possible that uh, it was a place name where the Yahweh cult started earliest. And we know that uh, the Yahweh cult has not necessarily been started by the Proto-Israelites. We know that the Midianites were the priests of Yahweh. I mean, the this uh, the father-in-law of Moses, according to the to the uh, book of Exodus, and, uh, Genesis and Exodus. I mean, Jethro, uh, 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 he was uh, the high priest of of Yahweh, and he was a Midianite. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not an Israelite. Uh, interesting. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, are those people, uh, Shasso, Piaku, uh, are they coming to Egypt in the time of Amenhotep III, I believe you said, or maybe coming out of Egypt? Do you know answer? No, no I mean, they tried to enter Egypt. We know okay. um, from the city, the first uh, campaign his, in his first year was against the Shosu, who tried to enter Egypt via the Horus Road via the fortresses along the Horus Road. But uh, uh, the name is known already before. I mean, uh, uh, from the 18th dynasty, perhaps already much, much earlier. But uh, there is even, I think, one mention in the Old Kingdom, in the 6th dynasty. But uh, if they were the same show, so in the New Kingdom, nobody knows. Anyway, uh, we know that, uh, I mean, hold up the second, uh, uh, made raids against the Shosu and brought many of them back as prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you comment uh, departure of Semites from Avaris, I believe in the uh, time of Ramses uh, the Second? Some uh, scholars uh, argue that uh, it is evidence for Exodus. So how you comment that? No, no, there's no proof that... Uh... Well, an exodus in the time of Ramses II, I think it's highly unlikely. Uh, I think we have to stick with uh, with the proof. I mean, the, firstly, I mean, the 
the Iron Age culture, which is identified uh, with uh, the emergence of the early Israelites, is uh, oh, I mean starts only with the end of the of the uh, I mean around 1200 BC, uh, maybe slightly before. Uh, this is uh, quite some time after Ramses II. Uh, and so the earliest mentioning, as I mentioned, is uh, from the time of Ram of Merimdach, from the sixth year of Merimdach, or fifth, fifth year of Merimdach, sixth year of Merimdach. Anyway, uh, there is no proof that uh, the Israelites uh, were in Egypt in the time of Ramses II. I could not, I mean, surely ancestors of them entered Egypt, left Egypt, uh, uh, by the body to Milat, uh, but uh, this is even likely. But uh, as I mentioned before, the ethnogenesis of the Israelites was not terminated before the 11th century, I would say. Uh, okay, thank uh, 12th you. 12th century, sorry, mm -hmm. not before the 12th century. Thank you. Can you comment on Merneptah the Stella? Because it is in, I believe, 13th century, right? It's a late, late. late. Yes. Okay. So uh, we, we, we have um, mentioned uh, Israel. So uh, 20th uh, dynasty is uh, later than Merneptah Stella. So how you uh, harmonize that with Exodus? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mentioned already that in the time of Merneptah, uh, the Israelites are known to the Egyptians as a tribe or as people without, uh, I mean, who were not sedentary, obviously, because otherwise they would have added a toponym uh, yeah. with the mentioning of the name. Um, but uh, what we also have to take into our mind that not all Israelites went to Egypt and not uh, uh, and uh, it was only a small, a relatively small group who, who were in Egypt, and uh, uh, the major part probably stayed there. And it was only a small group which left Egypt mm -hmm. in different uh, instances. Uh, like I, I tried to explain with uh, the time of of Asitnacht uh, in the time of Ramses the Third. Mm -hmm. And another matter, which I forgot, in the book of Exodus, uh, after the um, settlement in Canaan of the Israelites, we don't know it, Egyptians are mentioned. And uh, the Egyptians kept up Canaan as a province until Ramses uh, the fourth, and perhaps even until Ramses VI. Unthinkable that uh, a group of migrant nomads could enter the province of Canaan without mentioning Egyptians. The Egyptians were in control, particularly of the Jordan, maybe. They lost the control of uh, the, the, the coast. Uh, but uh, they controlled the Jordan Valley and the Jezreel Valley. So uh, entering uh, Canaan without uh, encountering Egyptians is unthinkable. And they are not mentioned. So this means this must have happened after Egypt withdrew from, from Canaan, after Ramses IV, something like that. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so uh, can you comment on... Uh... A view of uh, Dr. Douglas Petrich, uh, maybe you uh, know that uh, theory about uh, Amenhotep II and uh, maybe Tat Tatmos III. Uh, is there any departure of Avaris from that time or something? I think this is a very, uh, how shall I say, a theory which cannot be. I mean, it is true that uh, obviously during or after Amenhotep II, Avaris was abandoned for some time. Mm -hmm. Our theory is that uh, probably an epidemic broke out uh, at that time, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, I mean, the, the town of uh, of Peronefa was abandoned. 
don't, because also the peaceful period started with uh, Tutmosis the fourth. So Peronefa was not in need so much, and it wasn't needed again under Horemheb. Therefore, Horemheb started to build again at Peronefa. But uh, probably already, I mean, Hotep the third started to build the fortress already because we know from a statue of I mean Hotep, son of Apu, who was a sage in the time, in the very high, a very high official in the time of of um, I mean Hotep the third, he got the order of the king to fortify the mouths of the Nile, the estuaries of the Nile against uh, sea uh, robbers. I mean against pirates. Uh, who entered uh, the estuaries of the Nile and uh, raided villages. And therefore, this high official got the order to fortify the uh, estuaries of the Nile branches. And uh, there we have some evidence that there is a fortress older than the than the fortress of, I mean, of his, uh, than Horemheb's fortress. And I think this could be the fortress of Amenhotep III, from the time of Amenhotep III, built under the order of uh, Amenhotep, son of Hapu. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, is uh, only palace abandoned uh, or uh, entire? Yes, it was abandoned. The palace was abandoned, but oh. it has, we have no proof. I mean, this is. Um, uh, Petrovich, uh, this is too speculative um, to be uh, defended as a theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have just uh, two little questions if you have time. More. Are uh, some uh, proto Israelites maybe called uh, Habiru or maybe Hyksos by some people? So, is that no, Hyksos? Surely not. I mean, no, the, to tie the, the Hyksos have nothing to do with the Israelites. Okay. They were several hundred years before the appearance of the Israelites. Okay. And, uh, Habiro, uh, yes, uh, there is a thing. I mean, the idea that uh, the Habiro, uh, which were uh, tribes, but uh, perhaps not a specific ethnic one, they were also partly people who fled the towns in Canaan, in Canaan, in order not to be text or, and uh, they made their living by um, robbing uh, raiding towns or raiding uh, villages these were the Habiru a part of them may have been tribes I mean but uh, uh, a part of the Habiru were marauders uh, anyway uh, it's believed that the uh, expression Habiru comes from the Aperu which were uh, workmen in Egypt, mostly of foreign origin. Uh, it is uh, debated if the Habiru and Aparu were the same, but it is possible. Mm -hmm. um, so some changes in the in the, in the terminology happened, uh, and therefore it is the idea that the Hebrew, the term Hebrew, came from the Habiru. Mm -hmm. uh, but okay. uh, again, I'm not an Old Testament scholar, and I cannot uh, expand on these calculations. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. And last question. Can you comment about uh, Jacob Har seal? Does that have any connection with uh, Jacob in Old Testament? Well, you know, uh, names can be can be alive for, hundreds, for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Jacob is still known nowadays. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if a, a Hyksos or a, a predecessor of the Hyksos has the name Jacob Hare, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, he has something to do with or that he was uh, a, a, a proto-Israelite. Uh, I have to refute this. And so it is very unlikely. Mm -hmm. And in, names have a very long life. Many names have a very, very long life. And to go from one population to the next to come.
Mm-hmm. Uh, what mm-hmm. about uh, uh, Joseph uh, um, identifying uh, with uh, Sasobek? I believe Petrovic also said that. Uh, can you comment that shortly? No, no, no. Sorry. No. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is, uh, this is uh, too speculative. Uh, okay. <laughs> what I believe, what is possible, is I mean that uh, this uh, vizier-like uh, person uh, with the name Irsu in the time. Of, before uh, Seknach took over the reign of Egypt, mm-hmm. uh, was uh, uh, of Western Asiatic origin, uh, that he uh, could be a model for the story of Joseph. Uh, yes. Okay. And that, yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, at the end, uh, can you just comment uh, how do you think, because I'm a Seventh day Adventist Christian, so what do you think about, uh, I wonder, um, Adventist uh, archaeologists uh, uh, like uh, Siegfried Horn, William Scheer, uh, Michael Hazel, Randall Yanker? Do you know uh, their work and how you see them <laughs> as archaeologists? Yes, normally, surely they they are uh, they have high merits, and uh, of course, I follow their publications, uh, and uh, there are many others. Now, which are on, on Vogue, and not uh, always, for instance, uh, my colleague Israel Finkelstein, who uh, wrote a lot about uh, Exodus also, uh, with a very different uh, idea. He refutes, uh, um, he thinks that uh, the Exodus story was invented in the time of in the Persian period, and also Donald Redford from the university, uh, from the the State University of Philadelphia thinks uh, in this way, but uh, I think I have uh, I have uh, put forward reasons enough with the geography in the time of the and topography of the time of the nineteenth uh, dynasty and twentieth dynasty that uh, we could uh, be more. Uh, I mean that uh, we could imagine that the story developed much. Uh, before that time, I mean, it is a Ramesside period. Okay, uh, that's all uh, for me. And thank you, Professor. It was really inspiring. I really love your work. And uh, you are, for me, best archaeologist I know. So uh, thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.